question is how much. The second question is how does the USDA display this? If we think back to 2019, they didn't get the yield right until January. So, you know, the yeah. next question becomes, does the USDA shave this yield uh, on the August report? That's the first question. I, I seriously doubt they're going to raise it. That would seem a little, uh, <clears throat> a little nutty. But are they going to aggressively cut it? Two, this crop isn't like the crop for the last five years. We don't have as much fertilizer in it. So we're not going to really know until we know. That's the other big unknown with this. You bring that up, Mike, I've got a question. I know we got a few people probably listening in. This is kind of a, a personal question down here. Um, now, um, we're doing some tissue on corn. And, um, and Sterling, you brought up lack of fertilizer. This is not because of lack of fertilizer applied, okay? But we're seeing deficiencies in nitrogen right now in fields that might have had 240, 250 units applied. Any ideas as to why we might be supposed? Boy, Brooks, have you been saturated a little bit the last couple of weeks or? Yeah, I was breaking up a little bit. Have you been saturated as far as soil conditions, Brooks? Funny thing is we've not really had those big, big rains this year. We were just talking about that, how we've had a lot of rain but not anything that was just over the top. You know, I mean, the, the a two-inch rain that might have, you know, uh, fell slowly over a 24-hour period. Yeah, we've had that, but we haven't had that, you know, that four-inch runoff rain or anything like that. So it's it's a little I, bit I, bizarre to everybody. Yeah, I personally wouldn't be worried about it, Brooks. So Yeah, the corn shows matter. no sign of being short nitrogen. It's just the, the tissue test. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Brooks, current crop around Illinois look has a fantastic color. So, yeah. Well, it looks we'll like you will be the man of the hour, Mike. Um, I was just reading some commentary, you know, inside of, of AgriSospo North America. There's some, uh, there's some, um, you know, agronomy uh, help, whether that's in Europe or or some different areas, and you know, their their view and kind of it, it is literally the thirty thousand foot view is you know the crop is at 177 a tick above and it, mm -hmm. it certainly from our seeds doesn't seem like that's the case and maybe it's where we're at but but sterling you go west very far you've got big problems i've gotten several pictures from kansas uh for the vct this week and you know kansas is in big trouble there's a maybe 20 percent of the state up in the northeast that looks pretty solid but even they will tell you, you know, they're still very, very early. Um, they've got corn that's just pollinating. So the verdict's still out on the good stuff in Kansas. And we've got some, you know, we've yeah. got some pictures this week from Kansas that show, yeah. I mean, they show zero type um, yields in corn. An another uh, problem, and this has kind of slipped under the radar, but I noticed when I was looking at the weather changes is in Minnesota. Uh, the Minnesota crop is behind, and I've noticed conditions there. I still get the weather feed from Minneapolis from WCCO, and it's been hot and miserable up there, and we're seeing that start to reflect in the big growing areas, you know, in, you know, south of the Twin Cities there. And that's another area, because that's actually really good ground up there. Those guys, particularly that southeast corner of Minnesota, they produce a lot of corn in very little area. So we have the problems there, and I was out just, my yard looks awful. Any place there's sun, it's burnt. Even even with watering it regularly, it's cooked. And I've seen cornfields on the left side of the road, it's tasseled, looks great. Stuff on the right side of the road is four feet tall and looks uh, kind of peaked. So again, a lot of variability. And that was stuff that was dry land. I'm sure the irrigated stuff looks a little better. So. Um, again, very, very mixed, and um, Iowa is noticeably uh, behind as well, so we'll see how this weather plays out. It's We're supposed to get some rain, but it's going to be 90 today, 95 tomorrow, 102 on uh, on Saturday, and continued, you know, hot. I mean, there's a chance of rain every day, but, you know, again, does it materialize, and how does it materialize? And is it going to do anybody any good, or is it going to be, you know, 
R rain on the north side of the road, no rain on the south side of the road sort of thing. Well, you can see I've got uh, excellent satellite reception today. Uh, I think <laughs> I'm probably frozen on the screen. Um, Correct. Mm -hmm. We'll see if we can we'll see if we can correct that. Um, it may have come with me plugging in an iPhone into my computer, <laughs> and I may have to rejoin. That's the the best service you can get for two hundred and seventy five dollars a month. Huh? Isn't wow. that crazy? Wow. Rural broadband, right? That's. I am going to try to rejoin. <laughs> I'll be right back. Okay. Thanks, Brooks. Hey, we did ask for some uh, local weather and where you guys are calling from. Looks like we've got some uh, heat around the country for people who are calling in. Some people are getting some nice rain. So thank you guys for for uh, answering those questions. We want to remind you that we have our virtual crop tour going on. So be sure to tune in for that if you are interested. And participating in that, we would love for you to. The link is in that chat box. So make sure you check that link out. You can participate in that every week or just when you feel like it. We would just love to have your pictures, your commentary right in there. Also, when you go to that webpage, you will see that there is a segment from RFD TV. How cool is that? You will see that Brooks is now famous. Yay! Oh, and he's back on the screen. Yay! He's even famous here today. But we have him uh, every Friday at 8.30 Central Time. He is on RFD TV, and he is giving a little quick, brief uh, segment on their, on their show on the Market Day Report, and just telling a little bit, kind of a preview about the virtual crop tour. So be sure to tune in to that, and you'll get a little uh, quick, preview of what's going to be in the report that day. So be sure to tune in. We would love to have your your pictures, your commentary. Make sure you complete that survey every week as well. It's really quick. It's like two minutes. So I'm going to turn it back over to you guys. Um, we are recording. So go ahead and go for it. Let's have a great meeting. Christy, I'm gonna. We're gonna kind of let let kind of Mike be the uh, the the feature today. I know Sterling's gonna talk a lot about markets outside markets, but I think Mike's gonna have probably the biggest impact. The time of the year is critical. Um, mm -hmm. Folks in his in his job are answering the phone nonstop, kind of questions like I answered earlier. But I'm curious. We've got several states represented. I see Nebraska. I see North Carolina or North Dakota. Um, I see uh, Illinois, I see Indiana, uh, just on the participation, I see Ohio. Um, curious if, if you folks would uh, would jump on the chat and um, specifically to corn, we're talking about that 177 bushel per acre national average. Your thoughts plus or minus that, if you believe that that average is gonna be above 177, Chat in with a plus mark if you believe it's going to come in below 177. Um, chat in with a minus mark if you don't care. I'm just curious what the consensus is. You heard Sterling um, and, and Mike and myself talk about what we're seeing across the country. And while it's it's really early to tell, I think the consensus for the three of us is is below that. And and Sterling's you know Sterling's comment of how much below that is is the question. So uh, you guys can uh, punch that in. That would be great. I'd like to uh, like to see that. So market's a little disappointing, and uh, a little disappointing probably due to some pretty good conditions as far as the 10-day forecast, especially across Iowa and Illinois. I don't think anybody's going to argue with the fact that if you take a drive across any of those interstate systems, that area looks pretty solid. There's a lot of fringe areas that aren't. Sterling, I don't know if we're going to, what order we want to do this today. Christy, do you have Mike or Sterling going first today? It doesn't matter to me right now, Mike. Well, has Sterling, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this out there to you. Um, Sterling, we're, it, it would appear that this market is not trading 
maybe the good old fashioned fundamentals that we would see in regards to weather. After all, it's a it's been a hundred degrees in some areas of the country, and I know we've got a hundred in the forecast the next couple of days. Anything impacting these commodity prices that we're we just don't see that we're we're just not looking at in regards to weather. I know that there's there there has to be some. It would seem that there would be some negotiations behind the scenes out of Ukraine. We're we're seeing some things start to flow there. What's going on with these markets outside of weather and pollination that we need to keep an eye on? Well, the the first thing, if we go back and we think back to the March, February, March, April meetings, we talked about interest rates going up. They've gone up. We talked about how that's going to change fund liquidity. That happened. Funds have come in here and they have sold index funds included probably 125,000 contracts of corn. The interesting thing is they haven't piled into a short. That's the interesting thing. Usually if you are, you know, I'm, I'm funding, I'm long 1,000, I think we're going down, I usually sell 2,000, I meaning I go from long to short. We didn't see a lot of that going on this time, so that money is, while that pool is probably smaller, it is still sitting around. The next thing is I'm going to put up a chart here, if I can share, Christy. There we go. I'm going to put up a chart of the other thing that has been a problem. This is a chart of the U.S. dollar. Now, when the U.S. dollar moves higher, that means U.S. exports become more expensive. We become a less appealing place to buy grain. So if you can buy it from Brazil, you can buy it from Argentina. If you can buy it cheaper, that tends to weigh on prices. And if you've been watching export sales, this is the first week in four that I'm going to write a headline that doesn't say export sales were awful. This week they weren't awful. They were only dismal. So they're getting a little bit better. So that is the other thing that's pressuring it. But if you notice, you look at the dollar here, well, we made a pretty spiky move, and we've since come down a little bit. The European Central Bank raised their interest rates 50 basis points this morning, which was 25 more than expected. And they mentioned it's just it's like the Dow Jones Industrial Average. You take a bunch of currencies and pile them together, and you make an index. The euro currency is about 45% of that. And as you can see here, the euro has been going down. But look, we traded below parity. And now notice, we're starting to come back up. Now we've got a lot of volatility today because European bonds are different from the US and interest rates are different in that our market evolved naturally and the currency evolved naturally and the debts and the bonds for particular states evolved naturally. So, with the euro currency, it was plopped down on top of all of this. So let's compare, we're going to compare German bonds, Nebraska bonds, we'll put those in one camp. We're going to put Illinois and Italian bonds in another one. If you buy a state of Nebraska bond, it is not going to yield much. It is going to maybe pay you 1%. If you buy a state of Illinois bond, it's going to yield about 4.5%. If you buy a German bond, you're lucky if it pays you anything. If you buy an Italian bond, it's probably going to yield probably 45 or 5%. When those spreads move, in the U.S., it doesn't really matter, but when it happens in Europe, that drives their currency, and that took some of the steam out of the euro currency right now because Italy is once again changing their government. There will be a lot of headlines and nervousness around this, but um, Italy changes their government about as often as I rotate my tires. So it happens all the time. It's nothing to be that worried about. If we can, in fact, see the euro begin to rise and moreover the dollar index fall, that's something – that will lend support to commodity prices in a broad and general manner. The second thing that we have going on, and you're going to like this, at least everybody except my friends down in Texas, the, they get to boo at me this time. The other thing that is hamstringing grain prices a little bit is a general commodity malaise, and this is the price of crude oil. And as you can see, we're now below $100 a barrel. And can't say for sure that the tide's turned, but it's definitely turned at least for the time being. Are we going to go measurably lower? Well, I kind of think we could trade between 80 and 100. We stay up there. The oil companies will be fine. 
the public won't be as aggravated the pump. I mean, gas here went down about a dollar a gallon in the last week and a half. I paid under four dollars for the first time in a long time for premium yesterday. So that is improving. So as that generally moves, we can begin to increase our exports. We have some things going on in China that can change the direction eventually. But right now, all of this is weighing on the market. And yes, we see heat, we see concern, but this may take actuals again to get anything to move because the funds have just come out of an aggressive situation and they may be willing to move back in if we, you know, if we see yields, if we get down to, it won't take too much. 173 could probably change the tide on this, particularly if we see some decent Chinese buying come in. But and that's, a, that's, a, big, that's a big drop, Sterling. That that four bushel per acre is is a very very significant drop. And uh, yeah, a couple things I, I want to touch on. Sterling talked about the potential of of Chinese uh, purchases. There's a lot of rumors in the pipeline that we're getting ready to see some big, big Chinese purchases in regards to soybeans right around the corner. Uh, probably more than rumor at this point in time. The interesting thing, the market has probably digested that information. And if there's one commodity that seems to be trading a little bit lower right now, Sterling, it would probably be soybeans. And when we've seen these carryout numbers come down, it looks like the Chinese are, are back in business as far as purchasing. What in the world gives with the situation on soybeans? Well, right now the Chinese, they bought their first, we had our first flash sale yesterday that we've had in about three weeks, and they bought uh, 136,000 uh, tons of corn, which is not, or of soybeans, not that big of a deal. The Chinese are going to wait a little bit until they think they absolutely have to step into the market before they buy, so they're backing away. We don't have a lot of funds willing to step up here and buy. We're probably getting a little bit of farm hedging coming in here, pressuring things as well. So right now, if I'm if I'm a commercial and I need to buy corn, I'm gonna buy a little bit every day, but I'm not gonna step in here. Let's say I need to buy a thousand futures. I'm gonna buy 15 or 20 a day right now. I'm not gonna step in here and, and go flashing a 500 lot. So that's just kind of allowing the market to settle back. The Chinese, uh, sow herd increased by 2% in the last month. They're still about 7%, 6.5%, 7% below what they should be. So pork prices have moved up noticeably in China. So there is an incentive to increase pork production, a big one. I mean, pork prices moved from about a dollar a pound to last look, they were about $1.55 a pound. That is a big move. That is a big part of Chinese inflation. The Chinese aren't so much about moving currencies and manipulating interest rates so much. They will go make hogs because they don't want food inflation. So that's something that, you know, we get out here, we start getting more September, October, and that ball starts rolling a little bit. That's something where we could see them in the market, certainly for soybeans. We also see them in the market for corn. So we, uh, we may be setting ourselves up for a situation here where, we're all talking about um, great exports, maybe a little lower number on yield on corn at least. It may be a bit before the market can digest this. Are, are you thinking maybe uh, you talked about, you know, it takes the USDA a bit to adjust these yields. We may be looking at some type of delayed market reaction on our hands here. Yeah, we, we could definitely see it may, we, we probably were gonna have to get past Labor Day quite frankly. For some other macro things, there's this idea about the Fed pivoting and not raising interest rates anymore. I'm beginning to see, you know, the Philly Fed number came out this morning. It was the worst since 1979. We are seeing some signs that uh, enough economic, a slap in the face to the economy really is probably happening as we're speaking. Some sort of micro recession or a dislocation, relocation recession and if the Fed comes in here and says September, October, we're done raising rates or we may raise rates just a little bit, something like that, the dollar will pancake. The dollar will fall noticeably, and that will provide plenty of incentive for people to come in here and buy the grain, especially if we have corn. You know, let's say it's sitting decent at 581 right now. If it's sitting around here between 550 and 620, I think you could probably see some fairly aggressive buying. We'll also have a lot more clarity on just exactly how much corn's coming out of the Ukraine by then. 
Well, we're still in a situation on the Ukraine. I mean, we sit here through these WASDI reports, and in these WASDI reports, we we continually look at USDA USDA's corn carryout. I think last month we're looking in the 1.4s uh, billion, and and Sterling, you and I have talked, and and it is a complete crapshoot as to how Ukraine factors into this. But even with the limited shipments out, we know we've got to. <sighs> Well, let me let me back up. I, I made that statement with certainty. It would seem it's very likely that the U.S. has got to pick up that gap somewhere along the way. If it's a hundred million, two hundred million, three hundred million, four hundred million bushels, it would seem as if that 1.4 billion carryout number would have to de- decrease somewhat uh, to meet world demand. Uh, what are we missing here? I mean, you know, behind the scenes, if I'm trying to control inflation, if I'm trying to take it down, one of the things that we've talked about for a long time are these our commodity prices and uh, mainly energy, but on foodstuffs as well. We've got that. We've got a we have got a, a situation that demands lower prices, lower consumer prices out there. Do you think there's some things going on behind the scenes that's allowing this Ukraine crop to flow to the market? How much pressure are we seeing? What are we not seeing here? It seems like there's something that we're missing with the market movement. Well, if we look at wheat, which is the principal issue with the Ukraine, above and beyond corn and soybeans, the thing about wheat is if you're a miller, if you're making bread, you can adjust. Particularly, who's the largest importer of uh, wheat in the world? It's Egypt. They just bought 640,000 uh, more tons this morning. If you're Egypt and you're a bread maker, guess what? You're happy making bread. You're not trying to deal with a picky, discriminating American consumer. You're dealing with a guy who wants a piece of bread. So you can adjust your needs for your milling needs. You have a lot of flexibility there. I think the world has kind of adjusted to this and kind of moved around, and maybe we saw, you know, demand move a little bit, and that's not where we need to be worried so much about food inflation. The first thing is I put up a chart of diesel. Here's your number one problem right here. All this stuff is useless unless you move it from that bag of seed at the seed, uh, coming to the farm to that loaf of bread at the grocery store. Second yeah. thing is we may not be able to dodge food inflation. In this country, I think hog market is extremely extremely stout. The internals of the hog market seem to get a little better every day. Um, beef, we are, we're moving cattle right now that shouldn't be moved. It's too hot. They're not putting on weight, so they're going to be coming into the market. Down the road, that's going to be a problem. But if we knock energy prices down, that whole component of that price of beef has a lot of energy in it. That's kind of how, you, how we're going to probably dodge this. So that will leave room for these grain prices, I think, to fluctuate. So, Sterling, not to um, – I want to circle back and talk more about prices towards the end of this, but, uh, Mike, you're here, and I'm sure your your phone is burning up. I know I've had a few agronomy questions for you over the last week. When we transition this meeting to weather, and we'll come back to Sterling at the end of this, Mike, what we're seeing – you know, normally I think we would have had a lot of these discussions we're having today about two weeks earlier in the year. Um, yeah, and we've seen the markets, we've seen that volatility period that we normally see June 15th through the 4th of July up a little bit. And um, tell us how critical some of the fringe areas are going to be. Um, you did a great piece uh, for the virtual crop tour tomorrow talking about kind of the tale of two crops on each side of the Mississippi River. but. I think I think of special attention right now. Ohio has to continue to develop um, their late. North Dakota, Minnesota have to continue to develop to contribute to that national yield. Have you got any information today that would give us any leads as to what to expect in those areas? Yeah, I sure do. Uh, Brooks, can you see my screen okay, Christy? Yes, we can. Sounds good. I'm going to answer some of Brooks' questions. We're going to kind of break apart this U.S. crop today. And um, Sterling, Brooks, feel free to stop me, slow me down today. Pretty important stuff to talk about today. And I want to share your expertise, too, because Sterling's a weather guy just like me. So we're going to kind of break down. Normally on July 20th, we got a pretty good handle for the crop. And um, that's the case. I think the eastern belt, we've got some pretty good rain, some nice pollination. But 
I also continue to see slide and picture after picture from the Western Belt, Southern Plains of burnt up corn. And we've just got corn tasseling in the Dakotas. So there's a lot to talk about on July 20th. I wanted to start talking about the haves and have not. This is one of my favorite maps. This is the NOAA 30 day actual precipitation compared to average map. And the areas I'm concerned about are these areas here in red. I know there's not a lot of corn production in Oklahoma, Southern Missouri, Arkansas. But again, very dry weather coming here in the Southern Plains. Unfortunately, it's expanding into Western Kansas. Sterling's home state in Nebraska looks pretty ugly on the drought monitor. We've got the big state of Iowa to talk about here in a few slides. Now on the flip side, Illinois has improved some very nice rains here over the last 30 days, but not everybody in Illinois has got rain. Indiana's still a little bit dry, although they had some nice rains, but like approach here with Sampa over the last few years. Before I was an Illinois agronomist, no Illinois soil is pretty darn well. But as I continue to learn nationally, soil quality makes a big difference as far as what dry means to a crop. Um, case in point, the Iowa crop ratings on Monday came out 81% good to excellent, despite 47% of the state on a drought uh, map. And one thing I've learned here, especially up here in Northwest Iowa, um, a lot of these soils up here, $20,000 per acre soil, hold a lot of water. And that's kind of what fooled me last year. Um, the state of Iowa outperformed as far as yield with a few timely rains. And will that happen again? And one thing to watch over the weekend, um, down here in southern Iowa, the soil quality is not as good for the expanding drought here. So we'll really be watching the radar over Iowa. So again, it's just not um, the rain that's coming down. It's also what's under the ground as far as our soil moisture holding capacity. What about temperatures? Always talk about temperatures in July. Kind of a unique map here. I think right down here in the Southern Plains, you don't have water in your corn crop, crop pretty much burning up down here. A lot of that crop is already gone. Don't know if the real market realizes that yet. Um, up here in the Dakotas, heat's probably a good thing to push that crop along, especially if you've got water. And we've had really good temperatures kind of Eastern Iowa through my backyard in Illinois, through Indiana and Ohio. So again, Pretty good temperatures. Eastern belt, I think eastern crops getting bigger. Southern plains crop, pretty much beyond hope at this time, unless you've got water, and even some of the irrigators are running out of water. And the heat's probably been a good thing that year. So that's kind of what the heat map looks like um, looking into mid July. Want to talk about one of Brooks's comeback stories. Um, here in McLean County, um, our ground would go for $20,000 an acre if it's sold today, not going to sell today. Mom still likes her ground, so does my brother. But this is what the crop looked like just a month ago. Um, we had a very dry June. Again, that's a very piece of dirt. Corn was rolled up tight as a drum. We got a nice rain on June 25th. It's been raining ever since. And right now, if I had to put a number on that cornfield, I'd say 250. Um, pollination is complete. Two or three more inches of rain is all it's going to take. We turn the heat down, lots of sunshine. Again, 250 is very possible. And again, just a month ago, I was hoping for 150. So again, some miraculous things have happened in parts of Illinois. But again, it's just not all of Illinois. As close as Champaign, Illinois, they have to have rain, but the crops don't look nearly as good as that field. Um, there's our uh, May 10th planted corn. It was just now wrapping up pollination. Um, that field looks tremendous also. Fungicides ordered on that one. Again, 250 potential there. Uh, we don't have 200 bushel of corn in the bag yet, but a couple more inches of rain would get us the APH, and a couple more than that would get us close to potentially record setting fields. Um, one nice thing about the dry gene that we talked about earlier in the BCT and during our marketing calls, a dry gene is a pretty good thing. You don't lose a lot of nitrogen, you don't lose the water holes, and every acre is going to be harvested in my backyard. So that's some of the best corn in Illinois that was some of the worst just a month ago. Um, it's not that way everywhere. It's a picture I saw yesterday off social media. I think that one came from uh, parts of Kansas. I think it was in that western part of Kansas. And as you can see in that picture, I've got the irrigator runs over here, and that's what's on the uh, non-irrigated side of that field. This will be a zero. And one thing I'll need to have Sterling and Brooks help with, how do all these topped acres and zero yields affect our national yield? 
I would assume national yield is going to go up because less harvested acres, but total corn crop will go down. But again, I don't know that. That's a, maybe something that Sterling could talk about. That. Yeah, the the USDA, if they don't harvest it, that will go into the abandoned acres. So what will happen is the total harvested acres will go down. And in theory, that should push the yield up. Or at least it won't be a negative on yield. That's probably the best way to describe it. Yeah, how does the silage that will, affect that? The guy normally chops 100 acres silage, has 300 acres for silage. How will that affect our yield and our total crop production? Uh, if it's chopped for silage, uh, it won't affect the yield. They don't use that in the yield calculation, I think. I'll have to uh, probably yeah, run the USDA be, rule book. <laughs> kind of a consideration on that is um, on the acres, Mike, whenever we come out with our acres on March 31st and June 30th, on average, we've got about 92.4% of that planted corn is harvested. So you've got silage actually calculated in that. As far as how RMA regards this, if it is a prevent plant uh, claim on corn, it does not count in the acreage. However, if it's a failed crop in corn, it does count in the acreage and the yield goes to zero. So it's all kind of how it's determined now. How USDA looks at that versus RMA, I don't know. Um, I would assume they would be looking through the, the, the same lens, but RMA does view a failed acre as a zero yield. A prevent plant does not count into the equation. Yeah, thanks for that clarification, Brooks. That helped me a lot here. Um, it's just not parts of Kansas that are having uh, burnt up corn. It's also pretty common in Nebraska, Missouri. Again, non-irrigated crops uh, have taken a toll. And one thing the market really hasn't talked about, I've been seeing some pictures coming out of uh, Tennessee and Kentucky where they were pollinating when it was hot and dry a month ago, and a lot of that pollination was not very good. And also looking at today's drought map, we've got some pretty continuing drought, uh, actually intensifying drought uh, just east of the Mississippi and Kentucky and Tennessee. And I've been hearing a lot of the yields in the unirrigated fields in Texas very, very low. So again, we've got that nice crop in the east. We've got that rough crop in the southern plains into the western plains. And how this all correlates to a number, um, that's up to the experts. I'm going to talk just a minute about corn fungicide. Um, I think where guys have a crop, corn price is still pretty good. I think a lot of fungicides will be applied, and that is the case here in Illinois where it's been raining. If I walk into a field like that that's got two ears on every stalk, I'm definitely going to spray that. Um, just one sentence pretty well sums up the corn fungicide decision to me. Um, if your corn looks great, you've got mud on your shoes while scouting, then spraying a pollination to brown silk fungicide almost always pays for your other corn price is $3 or $7. And this year with a new crop price, uh, still probably close to $6 in a lot of the Midwest. It makes sense to get that Why? spray. Let me let me ask you a quick question, Mike, because a lot of agents get this thrown at them. My corn looks great. I see zero signs of, of disease. Um, I think my yield potential is above average. Um, do I spray that corn with fungicide from a, from an agronomy standpoint? What's your answer to that question? Yeah, I, I sure would, Brooks. Normally, corn disease doesn't come on until the corn goes through the stress of filling an ear. Um, so again, uh, whether I'm seeing a lot of disease in the field, if I've got a high yield potential field, I want to get that field protected, especially at five fifty to six dollar corn. Now maybe two fifty three dollar corn, uh, a little more of a um, decision to make on that. But it's pretty much a no brainer to spray your corn if it looks fantastic. You're going to get dew in the morning, and again, corn disease normally doesn't flare up until you go through the stress of filling the ear out. So it'd be a no brainer in my opinion. Good question, Brooks. Thank you. Um, I want to talk just briefly about tar spot. Um, one thing about tar spot, it was a big issue last year. It took a lot of bushels away in the Eastern Belt and through Iowa, Illinois also. Um, but one thing about tar spot, it's been too dry for this disease. Tar spot loves at least six inches of rain per month. I don't know if there's anywhere in the Midwest that's had six inches of rain. On our home farms, I can find tar spot there, but not much. So again, not seeing a lot of tar spot out there, but there could be enough tar spot and gray leaf spot. Some of your rust complexes to me, and along with anthracnose, always out there to justify that application of a fungicide. Um, just a little bit about tar spot management. Um, really doesn't change anything. If you're not seeing a lot of disease in your cornfields, no hurry to spray right at tassel time. Normally brown silk is a little better time because if you wait a little bit, um, that gives that disease more chance to develop and more chance for your residual to last a little bit longer. So if you're worried about tar spot, really wouldn't change a whole lot. And there was a lot of talk earlier this year about maybe spraying your corn twice, maybe three times for tar spot. 
But again, tar spot loves five, six, seven inches of rain per month. We just haven't had that. So I think one application around brown silk will get us uh, through on our fungicide decision. I get this question a lot um, here. Um, let's say on the flip side, your corn's burning up. You don't think it's APA. You don't even know if it's going to make 100 bushels. Um, what about spraying a corn fungicide for stress? And my answer on that is generally no. Um, I don't know if I'm a big believer in that. And why would you spray your corn if it's going to be below insurance levels anyway? Why put, more, put dollars into it? And another question, it's going to be 97 degrees here in Illinois on Saturday. I know there's a lot of down pressure from an airplane, but how much fungicide is even going to hit the corn when it's that hot? Dry. So again, and if you got burning up corn crop, I would save my money and not worry about that. Now, if you got a marginal corn crop, you think it's APH, you haven't been getting rain. In that case, maybe it's better to wait for the rain and then spray. You can never really get too late to spray that corn fungicide. Any questions on fungicides from Sterling or Brooks before we move on? I want to talk about the hot weather impacts on corn production. Um, the worst thing on a corn crop is kind of what's thoroughly described about his yard and everything in high sun is burning up and anything with shades okay. Um, hot, windy, low humidity days with lots of sunshine are hardest on a crop that's coping with moisture. Um, actually, humidity is worse on that, good for a corn crop. So, again, running out of moisture, you've got intense sun, it really magnifies the effect of daytime heat. And one thing that can maybe even trim a corn crop in Illinois where the corn crop looks pretty good for the most part. You start putting together five, six, seven, 72, 74, 75 degree nights in a row, that's detrimental to yield because whenever corn's job during the day is to collect photosynthate, and when it collects that photosynthate during grain field, it can do two things. It can, one, it can cool the plant bigger, or it can fill the air. Get those hot days in a row, you're not doing as good a job of filling your year, you're doing more job of cooling the plant and keeping that plant alive. And that's one of those reasons that sometimes in those hot years, Kernel counts are pretty good, but yields aren't quite as high. And again, a blessing here in Illinois. I woke up this morning, it was 65 degrees. So that's a pretty good day for grain fill. So, but down in the Southern Plains, Western Corn Belt, where it's 75, 76 every night, it has been very detrimental to yield, even if pollination was adequate. I'm seeing a lot of pictures coming through that uh, guys think was a pollination problem, but it was actually, it was a, a kernel abortion problem because of these hot nights and lack of water. So well, that's something that won't be, uh, be able to be uh, factored into the market uh, until we get down closer to harvest time. Um, another thing to consider as it relates to U.S. corn yields, again, we've had a lot of questions today, not a lot of answers, a lot of unknowns out there. Um, in my backyard in Illinois, we had that dry May and June, very few water holes in Illinois. You get to harvest the whole field, that's good for foreign corn yields. And Brooks asked a question about nitrogen early. For the most part, nitrogen loss is very low throughout Illinois and the Midwest. And the corn is very green in my backyard. As we wrap up corn production, here's kind of my numbers today. Um, current good to excellent corn ratings for 64%. Same as last week and just 1% lower than last year's record of 77. But think back to last year's crop, we were concerned about the Dakotas. Iowa was a flip state and it looked pretty good in most other areas. This year, we've got a lot more acres where we've got dry weather conditions, the whole Southern and Western Plains working its way into parts of Iowa, Minnesota now, and we've still got a few lingering spots. So I think there's a little more drought than this time last year. So that's why I'm around 175 today. Again, east of the Mississippi crop's getting bigger, west is getting smaller, but how do we measure how much smaller that crop is getting? Um, again, the wild card, we did a good job of explaining this thanks to Brooke and Sterling today. How will the chopped and non-harvested dryland acres affect yield and final production? So again, I think when the August numbers are released, the official number is going to come in 177 to 178. I think a more realistic number based on the drought maps and looking at the U.S. crop is probably closer to 175. Do we get down to 175? We might, but it may take a while. I'm going to talk just a little bit about soybeans. We had the atmospheric dicamba present again this year. It really dinged a lot of those beans that did not have the dicamba gene. Um, some areas where it's still dry, those areas are still cupped up. That can be potential yield issue as you can stay dry. But we've had pretty good rains. We finally outgrowed a lot of that cupping. I know in my backyard, I've still got that gamma damage on some of my flowers and my mom's green beets. The farm got hit pretty good. So that's just a load of dicamba. We're seeing it from the beans and also corn production. I want to talk just briefly about the um, soybean fungicide insecticide mix. At today's price, I think we should probably get 13 bucks for new crop beans in most areas of the year today. Again, kind of a no brainer here, uh, putting a fungicide on, except uh, the beans are burning up because of drought. But keep in mind one thing when the growers tell me about new growers with fungicides, 
Um, whatever you spray a fungicide, it will delay your maturity, so you 0.4 points and it makes beans harder to cut. So that's the only negative associated with fungicide. And I would definitely throw that insecticide in mix, uh, at least here in my backyard. Okay. And when you want to spray those fungicides, most beans in the U.S. are at R3. Um, you'll have a tiny pot in those top windows what R3 soybeans look like. Um, current soybean ratings, good to 61%, 1% lower than last year. Current uh, soybean ratings are 1% higher than last year. Um, the current U.S. soybean estimate is 51.5. In my opinion, it would be hard to see 51 because we didn't got get the early acres planted this year in 2022. Um, one thing I've learned also, soybeans surprised me at their ability to go down and grab water. But with soybeans right now, we're in the money time. It used to be August was a money time for soybeans. But with the early planting and uh, soybeans being grown more in the northern belt, I think the money time for soybeans today, July, 20th through about uh, September 1. So really hard to get a handle for soybeans. I won't be coming out with any soybean estimates until probably this time next month. Mike, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here and ask you a question because you, you brought up something about early planting. And um, I know we've got uh, a couple of uh, people kind of through my geographic band. Erin is on here with us. And I think she would attest to this. But last year uh, in, in the southern Corn Belt, we got out really early with soybean planting. And if you remember, our meetings last year in May and June were that the soybeans just weren't growing. They, they were, you know, they were planted early. They sat there. They didn't move. If you went out and looked at a field right now, you're going to see soybeans uh, visually in a similar growth stage to where they were at at this time last year. However, on average, I would guess that southern Indiana, where Aaron's at, southern Illinois, where I'm at, we're 30 to 35 days behind that planting date. Even though things look the same, do you think that will impact yield? You know, Brooks, looking Tough at question. the yeah, looking at the planting date studies, obviously beans planted mid-May are going to yield a little bit less than mid-April. But one thing we've seen um, through most of the Midwest the last two, three, four years, we just haven't got the early growth out of those early planted soybeans. So when early planted beans have the best opportunity to hit a home run is when they come out of the ground fast and by the longest day of the year, they're flowering with pods. So again, we got some beans in the ground early, but I don't know if they're gonna have a big benefit versus mid-May beans because they all look pretty much the same today. So we just haven't had the you know, I. I, I think a lot of people will attest to that. You know, I'm, you know, logic agrees with everything that you said. Last year, our later planted beans actually in growth stage caught those early ones. I mean, they looked very similar. When the combines rolled through the field, there were significant yield differences where those early beans out yielded those later planted beans. So, you know, it looks like this trend to earlier and earlier planted is just going to be something that, that sticks with us. I, we've got some farmers, you know, in our area. And, and we're kind of sticklers on wait till the wait till the ground is right to go over, make sure everything's perfect. And it seems like every year, you know, they go out early. This year in our area it was on Easter. They plant in the mud, and you think, oh, you know, these guys are they're they're going to have compaction problems. They're going to see you're going to see every turn row that they've got out there, and it doesn't seem to be the case. It seems like they they yield pretty well. I mean, do you think we're moving into a time period where we're we're going to plant a lot earlier despite conditions in the future? Yeah, probably so, especially the soybeans guys will still be a little more cautious with their corn. And one thing, too, probably the thing that's helped both corn and bean yields, uh, more and more farmers throughout the um, corn and soybean growing areas are geared up to plant corn and beans at the same time. Really, it helps them. Let's see. Excellent question, Mr. We'll kind of wrap up here today talking about the drought map and the forecast. Um, again, looking at that drought map, that's this morning's update. Um, I see a lot of uh, colors on that map. Um, concerning me is uh, where the jury's still out in Minnesota crop. Um, I know where Sterling lives, at least on the drought map, you're okay, but man, the state of Nebraska, about 50% irrigated, a lot of color on that means with a lot of non irrigated corns in trouble, um, like Brooks. Little better conditions in uh, northeast Kansas, but it's still been hot there. Western Kansas is a mess. Again, not a lot of corn grown in Oklahoma. Southern Missouri crop looks pretty rough. We've still got some lingering drought in parts of the eastern belt. Um, does not look like a record yield breaker, but last year's drought map did not look like a record yield breaker, also. And one thing, too, we got to talk about most of this corn up here in North Dakota is just now starting to pollinate. 
it's got a long way to go. So um, again, no reason to say it can't flare up and get some dry conditions here. So again, extreme amount of uncertainty trying to put a corn up based on a drought map like that and based on the stage of the crop. One positive here, and I think the market is looking at that today, um, pretty good rains for eastern Iowa through the eastern belt. I think another one to two inches through Illinois would put us probably at 205 plus, maybe working our way toward 210. But looking at that map, um, not much rain for the Dakotas. Sterling's home state stays dry. Kansas continues to burn. Southern Missouri continues to burn. Also, we've got this pocket down here, not a huge corn production area, but boy, hot weather. Planted corn down here. Um, while that corn's in grain fill could also be some issues. So again, that's what the seven day map looks like. Also pretty good news in the six to 10 days. The heat maybe goes a little bit further south. Pretty good rain throughout most of the belt. And the same on the eight to 14 days. So I can maybe kind of justify how the market feels pretty comfortable that the corn crop is in the bin. Um, me not quite so sure. So again, talked a lot today. Pretty um, strong opinions on fungicides. That's pretty simple to do, in my opinion, pretty much a no brainer. But again, trying to put a number to the corn crop because of the state of the crop, um, where it's dry versus where it's wet, a little tough to do here today. At that point, I'll turn it back over to Sterling and Brooks, unless there's any questions for me. Mike. Awesome job, Mike. Um, I, uh, it's a kind of a, it, it's really, everybody reports in on the, the virtual crop tour of spotty conditions. You know, uh, today I know Ron is on here. He talked about how dry it is up in his area of, of Minnesota and, and about, it's about five minutes after he made that comment, I got a, I got an email and a picture from somebody not that far away that's talking about crops that you know are late but good so we've got a mixed bag so far it would seem like the asna edge team are somewhat contrarians to to what's going through mainstream media out there in regards to yields i've read a lot of you know uh, 177 plus type estimates this morning that are out there on the wire i uh, also talked about you know just not maybe diving into these areas that are tough Sterling, there's a lot of things out here in the marketplace. We just touched on very few of them. You touched on the dollar. We touched on the, the fundamentals that we normally look at, like exports. Uh, we, we talked about energy prices. What good, uh, what good nuggets do you have for us at the end of this week's marketing meeting that we should really pay attention to? I, I kind of guided you into those questions, but if we were to get into your mind right now, what are you really concentrating on here for the next couple of weeks? Well, uh, yields, obviously, number one, and how, how these forecasts verify. Three items. Number two, how does the Chinese situation and the hog situation develop? Uh, and how is that going to affect exports, especially looking around the corner? And three, we have some breaking news. President Biden has tested positive for COVID. And that sparked a bit of a sell-off in the stock market, and that is promoting a little bit of a rally in the dollar. So if we could see the dollar reverse, that changes the game. If the dollar stays, much more expensive than ours, so they can certainly step up and buy as much as they want to. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those are the three things right now, and check with me after lunch how I, uh, how I feel about that. We are seeing some destruction, uh, some herd depletion uh, in the cattle market that may affect our feed numbers a little bit. On the other hand, the price of gasoline's coming down, so that may improve ethanol consumption a touch. A touch. Pretty interesting. We talk about ethanol there for just a second. So if you are near ethanol plants where they compete with the export market, the rail market, uh, we have seen those those ethanol values. If uh, four weeks ago, they came down tremendously. I think probably a lot of people saw that. If you're on the Ohio, the Mississippi, and you've got a, a place to deliver on the river or at an ethanol plant for a long time, ethanol was the market. It switched over <clears throat> about three weeks ago uh, to where the river was the market. 
In other words, the export, the NOLA, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana market was the best one. We've seen a change in that, Sterling, over the last few days where ethanol seems to be back on top. Um, you think we'll see that trend in the harvest? I think that can continue, especially if we take some of the steam out of energy prices. Again, gas here, premiums down about oh, 90 cents a gallon. Uh, regular unleaded is down probably a dollar ten. Looking at where the board is, we could probably see pump prices get close to that three dollar level, which that goes from being destructive on the economy and driving to being just annoying. So yeah. at that point, you know that could certainly spark a little more driving, and that could help ethanol consumption a, a little bit, especially with the prices being a little bit lower for corn right at the moment, at least. You know, I don't want to put you under the gun and pull up supply and demand tables, but let's talk about that real quick. You know, I think ethanol is kind of this 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 story that nobody talks about. But I think six months ago, if we'd have looked at this thing and we'd said 5.2 billion bushels of U.S. corn going into ethanol, you and I would have said we're going to trim that a little bit, and that hasn't necessarily been the case. Um, domestic uh, domestic feed. Maybe trim the smidgen, but not a lot. Still, still a pretty good head of steam domestically. So we turn then to exports, and um, exports are the big, big question mark. If I'm looking at one thing here over the next two months to kind of maintain some type of floor underneath these prices, let's assume, let's assume that um, mainstream ag pundits are correct, and we're at 177 bushel corn yield out there we have to look at exports to maintain some type of price level here. And, um, and of course, when we boil that down, we've got, a, we've got a, a consistent buyer in Mexico. You know, we never talk about Mexico. Those bushels are going to flow. It all hinges on China. So with everything you've kind of told us today, I'm going to look at that dollar very, very closely. I'm going to look at any kind of news outside of China. Now, China has been under a lockdown in a couple major port cities that's easing up. That should mean good things for corn flowing in there. Uh, any um, any disagreement on that supply and demand situation that I just illustrated, are we, are we wrong to really focus on China? No, China is going to be the big variable, but... On the subject of Mexico, Mexico is going to have their best year of imports ever. They could add to that next year. There's absolutely nothing standing in the way. Their currency level, I'm looking at it right now, has not really been affected by the dollar that much. In fact, we're at the same level we were last November. So we could see a little bit more come out of Mexico. You know, they take a little bit more. And China, you know, basically plays ball as expected. You know, um, we're watching exports there. Good commentary on Mexico. I want to kind of turn to our customers business. I know we got a couple of farmers on the call, primarily agents out there. Folks, I, I as I as I start to pay bills on a small farm, um, and I put together estimates at the beginning of the year, I'll tell you a quick story. I've got an eighteen year old and um I didn't want to just hand him the reins on farming. I think he should have experienced kind of a small business firsthand. So he he put out his first crop, and I and I was I was ruthless. I charged him for tractor rental. I charged him for planter rental. Uh, I had him do a budget on everything. I thought it was a great exercise. And he went in, got his operating line at the bank, and um, didn't he didn't like that at all. That was completely uncomfortable. For him, you know, the, the banker asking, you know, what do you have for collateral? And so, you know, he's listing all the things that he holds a dear. And then all of a sudden he's like, why is that important? And the banker just basically says, because if you can't pay off this operating line of credit once you borrow money on it, <laughs> that's what I get to take. Well, <laughs> as time has gone on, we've been very, very liberal in our budgets. Uh, we, we looked at, we, we tried to overestimate our expenses at the beginning of the year. We, we really did, whether that was, he didn't have fuel costs because he's paying rental rates, but those rental rates will go up month to month based on some University of Illinois data. We started to break down our chemical costs, and this is a three-pass system on corn. So, Mike, I mean, you've got you got the sprayer going across three times. 
Uh, we've got one pass on fungicide so far, and we totaled up his his actual bills and what he's paid, and it's it it's it's astronomical. It even begs the question, you know, to go to the supplier and say, is is this actually correct? Is this actually right? Everything's being done custom at this point in time. We we budgeted. I know it's going to sound crazy. We budgeted $110 an acre. Um, that's for that's for all of our herbicide, our insecticide, and our fungicide. We're going to blow that out of the water. The reason I bring this up is, I have a feeling. I have a feeling that our customers, our farmer customers out there, are going to be shocked at the end of this year. I think there's going to be a lot of people that have average to above average yields. I'm going to listen to what I'm saying here because this is kind of crazy and will not make money on the corn crop. Um, and of course, every situation is different. Land cost separates farmers in a big way. And what I mean is that the cash land cost out there, whether that's land that they're, they're farming that's paid for, whether it's land that they're farming they're making payments on or cash renting, that's the biggest separator. Equipment is the second one as far as out-of-pocket cash costs. And you can argue that all you want to, but I still think that husband and wife that are on the same farm team at the beginning of the year, they don't talk about depreciation and they don't talk about the return that they get on ground that they've already got paid off. I, those are those are those are real questions, but they're not realistic questions that they ask. And I think that there's gonna be a lot of areas where we run in the red this year. After such a great year last year, you would think it would be impossible. So I think we've got to be mindful of that. And I, and I don't have any any solution for it at all outside of as we start to know these expenses, if this market does pop back up, uh, there may be some opportunities to place floors, uh, certainly not the floors that we had two months ago, maybe. We may have to be patient to get back to those levels. But I think it's going to be a pretty challenging year for a lot of the people that we serve every day. Yeah, and don't expect any help from the mainstream media on this. Everything that I hear is, oh, farmers are going to be making money. They're going to be making money hand over fist, buy stock in Ford, buy stock in John Deere, et cetera. And that is not the reality that we're going to see. It's going to be – it seemed like a good year, but everyone forgets this is the most expensive crop that was ever planted. It, no by doubt, no doubt about it. pretty good margin. It, yeah, mm -hmm. By a pretty good margin. It, it's pretty amazing. Having said that, you know, we've got a lot of carryover from last year. So there's going to be, we've still, we can still ride the wave on, on the, the John Deere uh, thing for a few more months. But like Sterling said, at some point in time, uh, farmers will stop buying. And uh, I think we're probably three months away. I think you're going to have some, some pretty good spending at the end of this year on equipment, maybe some prepays on fertilizer, maybe if the price comes down. On that note, uh, Mike, generic glyphosate, uh, five pounds, uh, no case salt, regular, has come down tremendously uh, mm -hmm. over the last three weeks, I think $35, $36 a gallon in our, in our market. Um, so we're starting to see that a little bit. But Sterling, to your point, yeah, the, the spending spree uh, that we've seen is it sure looks like uh, we could be seeing the end of it here the next three or four months. And let's keep in mind, when we get into September and October, we have a whole new set of risk factors. How are things going in South America? Which, if we get a third year of El Nino, maybe we'll get a little support from there. But, again, that's something we absolutely cannot count on. Absolutely not. Right. Kenny, you know, it's interesting. I, Zerlin and Mike and Christy know this, but I was in Argentina for about 10 days. I uh, got back about two, three weeks ago, and um, I, I got to look at three of the four big provinces in Argentina where soybeans are about 89% of their acres are, are produced, and it's extremely, extremely dry in those areas. As a matter of fact, one of the places we were going to say we couldn't um, because the aquifer was no longer supplying, uh, you know, water to the well there. We had to, to move over, and that was in uh, Santa Fe province down there. So they have got some extremely dry conditions. That's a great thing for planting progress, but um, when I, well, it's noticeable. I mean, even, even as a visitor there who's not there regularly, you notice that they're in, they're in trouble. So that La Nina is definitely something we want to keep an eye on as well. 
And one other little news item, cash hogs are just under their all-time record high today. And that would pretend maybe we'll see a little more hog production. So what we lose in the cattle, we may make up with the pigs and the chickens here. Certainly you care to give a quick update of where we're at on December corn, November soybeans. I know we were oh. at a big sell-off when the meeting started. Well, we were a little bit lower here. Let's see right now. Uh, December corn, 575 and three quarters, down 14 and a quarter. So we're about three cents off the lows of the day. Novi beans, 1308 and a half, down 23 and three quarters, about four cents off the lowest levels of the day right now. Uh, crude oil is down four bucks a barrel, and unleaded gasoline is down 16 cents a gallon, and diesel is down about 13 cents a gallon. So what you're telling us is the ASNA Edge monthly marketing meeting did not impact the market over the last 30 minutes, right? <laughs> um, to, yeah, yeah I, so far we haven't seen any impact. Uh, the S&Ps are down 16. They were down 36 after the Biden uh, COVID news. So that side of the market is picking up. The dollar is still – it's up a little bit and shaky. That's – and let's keep in mind, it's vacation season in the U.S., it's vacation season in Europe. Um, you know, the complexion of this thing may change a lot, you know, post-Labor Day. Yeah, yeah. Well, good stuff. Um, Sterling, Mike, I appreciate it, your time. I'm kind of here as a guide, and that's about it. I let all these guys do the heavy lifting. But um, I think we walked away with this with a kind of a perspective of maybe we're contrarian. Uh, certainly not a terrible crop in the U.S., but uh, the odds of it being below sub uh, trend line yield look like uh, they're high. And uh, touched a little bit on the, the dollar, touched a little bit on the livestock situation, how it impacts supply and demand. So good stuff over the last hour. Um, while we've got everybody on here, a couple of opportunities. Christy, have there been any questions come through? If there hasn't been, and now would be a good time for the um, for the attendees to ask if they've uh, if they've got any. Um, I haven't seen. I wish we could. I wish we could unmute everybody, and uh, just just uh, ask those questions and talk. But I know that's not a possibility. So use that chat box if you don't mind. Yeah, I can't unmute everybody, but I haven't seen any questions if you do have a question let me know everybody has been great to engage and send us you know what's going on in their area in regards to weather you know you know you know needing rain you know like the next couple of days you know we'll make or break you know really appreciate that you're letting us know what's going on there corn is starting to tassel rain is spotty that kind of stuff thank you thank you thank you um Several minuses, by the way, from your plus or minus 177. I'm sure you noticed that. Um, no, no questions. But if you do have any questions, be sure to send those to us at marketinginfo at sampo-intl.com. We'll be happy to answer those. You are welcome to follow us on all of our social media platforms. We're everywhere. If you haven't found us yet. Please look for us. We are AgraSampo. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how Brooks uh, sums up the crop tomorrow at 8:30. So tough job. Yep. Yeah, All it's right. gonna be it's tough gonna be job. a tough one. To, it's gonna be a tough one. You know, um, you guys have to give me some advice on this. But each week, you know, we, we try not to put too much into what we think is the crop is, and more of what the stories tell us in the virtual crop tour. But it does seem like this week. It seems like each week we get a state that really hits us with a lot of information. Two weeks ago, that state was Ohio. Last week, it was Missouri. And it may have been because we were all in Missouri and we got to see that firsthand. This week, without a doubt, it's Kansas. I've got several Kansas pictures. And, um, you know, they're they're brutal out west. Uh, we got some good ones in the northeast, but they're brutal there. So. I really think the the storyline remains the same. Iowa, Illinois have to have big shoulders. I mean, they we have to have things go exceptionally well over the next 30, 30 days in regards to weather because um, it's going to be a challenge. And then the, the other one, I think, is North Dakota and Minnesota. Um, yeah, we're going to have to have them. They're going to have to have an average yield up there. 
and it's way too early to tell. And uh, we're just seeing some some pollination that's just starting to occur because that crop was planted so late. So I think that's going to be like those those critical extra bushels that get thrown into the, the mix. So I really think that will be the storyline tomorrow, which is very similar to what it's been the last few weeks. Yep. Absolutely. We want to remind you all that we do have our August WASD that will be coming up on the 12th. Um, and I know Sterling, you said that could be a pretty good one for us. I see some English mean, numbers turn. Well, yeah, the USDA usually changes yields on that a little bit. We may see some acreage number changes as well. So uh, we'll see where we're sitting, but that one does have some potential to be a market mover, especially if, uh, you know, the weather, uh, if we have really good weather, it's going to be, you know, it's obviously going to could be potentially bearish, but if we see, you know, a little bit of a shave of that yield, uh, you know, even even one bushel an acre takes that balance sheet for corn from 14 down to the lower 13s. That's, uh, that that may be enough to spark uh, the kindling in the market here. Okay. All right. Well, be sure to join us, you know, for that next WASD. And um, like I said, if you have any questions, be sure to send those to us at marketinginfo at sampointernational.com. It's been a great meeting, guys. Thank you so much. We have recorded today's meeting, and it will be available in an upcoming uh, daily market email. If you're not getting that, again, send that to us at marketinginfo at sampointernational.com. We'll be sure to get you on that email list. In that email, we have our most recent podcast. So we want to make sure you're signed up to receive those so you don't have to wait for that email. You can get that if you subscribe to those podcasts. You'll get them as soon as they're released. Sterling does those for us twice a day. He also does a livestock podcast. Three times. Yep, three, three, three times a day. Mm -hmm. He does the daily market uh, twice a day, and then he does a livestock podcast. So you can hear him three times a day, and you don't want to miss that voice. I mean... He has good stuff for you. So, <laughs> anyway, we, we do thank you for joining us today. And uh, we, we wish you a really, really great rest of your summer. And we will talk to you in really just a few weeks. Thank you all for being with us.